want to talk um, today uh, about digitally produced uh, publications of previously printed uh, texts and some of the issues that are raised by an online digital archive of avant-garde books and magazines. Um, and one that I've curated for um, the last 12 or 15 years now um, under the name Eclipse. Uh, and in some ways, I, I don't need to go any further than uh, that, that either of those pairs of terms, either digital archive or avant-garde archive, puts into place a series of dynamic contradictions and competitions uh, from the very beginning. But I'll step back uh, and come at those phrases from a further pair of contradictory and competing terms uh, that I think are implicit in what what I just said, which have um, defined the early history of producing digital text for publication. So on the one hand, um, digital media offered this uh, you know, the, the old seductive dream of lossless reproduction. The idea that we have these easily generated copies, they're gonna be identical from generation to generation, so that unlike uh, the decades old mimeograph uh, that might be represented on Eclipse as part of the archive. We get each copy inked slightly differently, each unique object slowly uh, burning in the oxygen of our environment, staples rusting, paper acidifying and yellowing, uh, and so on. In contrast to that, the abstract numerical sequence um, that constitutes the scanned image of that Mimeo page, what you're looking at now, um, doesn't fade, doesn't chip, uh, doesn't tear, doesn't, no matter how many times it's read or reproduced. Though errors do, of course, uh, get introduced into digital files, it's also true that each time the image gets summoned from the web, from the server to the web browser, that can be better. Okay. Uh, carry on, Craig. Okay. Um, each, 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 each time your browser summons, summons this file from, from the server, um, it's reassembled with algorithms that in fact search for and report um, and perhaps even repair the corruptions, um, what, what you might think of as the sort of digital wear and tear of the file. Um, you know, which, you know, Im imagine if library patrons going to handle uh, this unique item in special collections um, were actually part of, part of the conservation of the material rather than its de disintegration um, and deterioration. So there's that dream of the sort of lossless file. Um, but on the other hand, the utility of a web-based archive uh, is pre predicated not on replicating or maintaining, but on rather, rather, rather is based on radically reducing uh, the information of its content, right? The, the efficient distribution of these files um, copied to networked machines, the imperative that the internet, that data be effectively transferable, depends on the compression of data uh, into reproductions that intentionally contain far less information than the original does. So archives, on the one hand, right, want to preserve every, every last bit of information. Um, the internet aims to jettison um, as, many, as many bytes of information as it can. Indeed, for many file formats, um, MP3, uh, files, uh, the JPEGs um, on the Eclipse archive, for instance, the files retrieved by users um, not only contain fewer data, um, but data that are in fact uh, empirically different, right, in their strings of ones and zeros, actually different, not only from the original, but from copy to copy on each unique user's device. So even if we all pull up the same file, um, the, the file on your laptop and your telephone and your laptop and my screen here are actually gonna be um, different despite the fact that they're putatively looking at the same file, which is not a problem for users, right? Fortunately, the raster of the human eye is uh, um, you know, low, low enough that it's not gonna, not gonna notice those discrepancies. Um, it's not a mathematical problem for the rendering of the images on your screen, but it is a, a theoretical problem if um, if you're worried about the ontology of the 
the objects themselves. It is a problem if you need to know what thing it is you're archiving. Um, so in short, there's this ideology of the digital, um, and then there are the practical mechanisms of the digital. Um, and they're not congruent, and the latter not compatible um, with the dream of the archive. And a digital archive, accordingly, uh, then is you know, something like a sponge. It, it first you know, diastolically absorbs as much um, as it can, and then systolically uh, contracts and compresses as much as it can. You, you, I want to acquire as much information as possible when I'm scanning and archiving uh, a piece of work, and then I want to include as little information as necessary when making that work available online. So the characteristics of digital media generate this continual dynamic between uh, fidelity and degradation, uh, between accurate facsimile and serviceable uh, impersonation. Uh, and you can see the same distinction uh, in the different ways that digital literature has been understood in its short, uh, short happy life uh, of personal printing uh, and desktop production and publishing. So the digital uh, design tools that initially captured the imagination of pre-internet uh, scholars like George Landau, um, these are the tools that made, made Apple computers uh, initially so attractive, appealed because they permitted everyday, uh, essentially untrained vernacular programming illiterate users to control the look of their own documents, or typeface, margins, these things we take for granted now. Um, but to do that in ways and with precisions that at the time had formerly been available only to uh, command line competent commercial compositors or, or very patient professional printers. Um, and in fact, uh, the same typesetting tools uh, used by commercial publishers were also the origin of the markup languages that have defined the web ever since. But the fate of digital text on the internet um, that production and publication of print online, as we know, developed very differently. So in stark contrast to the sort of set prescriptions of word processing and desktop publishing, web display, like most ebook formats, um, is only ever a suggestion. It's, it's not set. Um, it is by its very nature uh, impossible to fix precisely. So once again, we get this twin um, impulse of the internet digital archive to preserve something and to present something to faithfully reproduce and then to effectively distribute uh, at fundamental odds with one another. So formats, digital formats aside, um, that same tension between fixity and fluidity um, is also manifest, I think, at, at the very abstract level of the very concept of what would be a digital archive. So the ambition of every archive is to preserve. Um, but to archive inked uh, paper through digital media right, is obviously patently absurd. This is a perverse, futile strategy of attempting to stay the ephemerality of one medium through media that are even more tenuous uh, and mutable and prone um, to just their sheer un unrecoverability uh, and technical obsolescence. Though that's hardly the only irony uh, of the Eclipse Archive, especially given its devotion to what were often ephemera uh, in the bibliographic sense to begin with. And indeed, there's a fairly, fairly recent addition uh, to the Archive, which is this uh, 19, no, it say, 1985 um, publication by Andrew Schelling titled Blanket, um, for which uh, there is no other record. Um, there's certainly, there's nothing online. There are no traces of this in any of the libraries uh, or conventional archives or bibliographies uh, that I've been able to find. And it's a book that Schelling himself, in fact, doesn't even remember having written. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of weed at the time, but still, still, you think you remember your book. Um, so Blanket goes from being completely forgotten, right, even by its own author, uh, to existing in, you know, what may be a, a unique copy um, that was loaned to me to scan, um, and is now more readily available uh, than any of Schelling's more recent, uh, you know, in-print books. 
um, or um, maybe stranger yet, uh, consider uh, Clark Coolidge, um, poet, um, maybe what we'll be talking about in, in the seminar portion, um, who's often used uh, popular genre uh, novels as source materials, and Coolidge's own um, originally fugitive works printed in editions of only a few hundred uh, privately distributed copies are now more readily accessible on Eclipse than the mass-produced novels that were his source text. So it's 1985, that's right. Um, so if we think of something like Coolidge's uh, Bond sonnets, uh, these series of chance-generated collage texts, they're inspired by John Cage's masostic techniques of writing through a source text. Um, and you think of, think of the, the title there, Bond, Bond sonnet, on the one hand, this is this densely rhymed, um, antibacchic uh, Bond sonnet, antibacchic, typical of his signature um, consonant-heavy, uh, densely patterned poetic phrases, um, but also pointing to his own mode of production. It's typed on business Bond paper. Um, Coolidge worked his whole, uh, whole writing career on a typewriter, um, and at the time we acquired this at least, um, didn't himself have a computer uh, with which he could see his book's future uh, ar archival lives. But the title also points um, to the poem's source in Ian Fleming's uh, novel Thunderball, uh, which had an initial print run of over 50,000 copies, um, but can't even be glimpsed in snippets on Google Books today. Um, nor can you get a look at more than a snippet of Peter Benchley's Jaws, uh, one of the primary sources for Coolidge's book, subject to a film. Uh, yeah, just a random page from subject to a film. People are starting to call sharks Jaws. They slip. Um, so it's not just that, my point, not just that new media make some works available, um, but that they also obscure, that they eclipse um, others, right? Where is the knowledge lost uh, in information, as, as T.S. Eliot put it, um, as far back as the 30s. Now, even when, um, we'll go back to it, even when it came out uh, a decade ago, it wasn't easy to find a copy of Coolidge's subject to a film. While Jaws, um, conversely, the number one super thriller um, bestseller, uh, Jaws was inescapable, right? Sold um, over 20 million copies worldwide, uh, which is to say it was printed in 40,000 more copies, 40,000 times more copies of Jaws printed than of Coolidge's book. But today, thanks to the digital archive, um, you can read Coolidge's book on, on, on your telephone, um, whereas his once mass-marketed sources are all but invisible in the free, um, collected, aggregated, uh, internet library. Now this state of affairs is, is obviously going to change and um, you know books come on and off Google Books, they come on and out of uh, archives and certainly all of the current technologies working together um, to make the digital archive legible are going to be quickly superseded. Um, the, the current state of the soon to be eclipsed archive uh, will be entirely unreadable um, and invisible as well, um, which say that the archive of the archive um, is going to be difficult to emulate. And this is a, I want to make this as a theoretical point um, that holds regardless of whether I'm able to you know, migrate content to new platforms or protocols or developing software. This is not just an annoyance for, um, you know, for, 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 for IT support people, it's a serious theoretical problem from the point of view of bibliography, from a librarian um, or, or an archivist. Um, it's this perpetual loop from which literary objects can no longer escape. Because by archiving books, the archive itself adds to their bibliographic information. So even the most faithful facsimile uh, on, in a digital archive produces entirely new um, editions. Um, or as Jacques Derrida puts it in uh, Mal d'Archive, in um, uh, Archive Sickness, 
the archivist produces more archive, and that is why the archive is never closed. Um, and worse, worse yet, every computer, of course, is itself uh, a kind of database in archive. It's ceaselessly generating um, second and third order data simply to store and transfer and render what we see as its content. Um, and what we see, or what we're meant to see on the computer, um, is only a fraction of what the computer itself generates, even in its most passive, sleepy modes. Um, the, the, that, that clean, cold, noiseless promise of these perfect digital reproductions um, are bought at the cost of uh, a sort of deafening digital noise that's muffled beneath um, you know, what we see is just a tidy graphic user interface of, of the display. Um, and indeed, most writing today, I don't, know, I don't know quite what to make of this, but this strikes me as the most important, most important point about textual production in the 21st century. That, that, that most writing today of any kind, um, by orders of magnitude, is text that's written by machines for other machines. It's not meant for humans. Um, to read it all. And so like um, something like an editor's preface or the blurbs on the back of a, of a book dust jacket, I think that that writing has to be considered as part of the new edition of the digital edition of any digitized book. So the very existence of a digitized file um, is continually generating these coded paratexts and any attempt to capture or record those um, only, only speeds their, their proliferation. Um, or to, to put that sort of generally and, and, and succinctly, recording media always record their own recording. So archival preservation of historical artifacts is always creating its own historicity. Um, and I want to underscore that this is, this is true regardless of anything that we ourselves enter on a keyboard or initiate with, with a trackpad gesture or a click um, or any sort of command. Um, and the, the good example of this comes from programmer and artist um, Nin Martin House, um, who's uh, fairly recently published a, a book called uh, Diff in June. This is a terrible title. It's such a good project. Um, it's a really great project with this awful title, Diff in June, uh, which is sort of technological autobiography uh, that represents one day in the life of his personal computer. And House basically just writes a, a, a very small script to extract and record each block of data that had been changed within his file system when compared to the previous day's uh, disk image, and then write that to a new file. Um, and that file is um, enormous, even though it contains only those data that the computer wrote for itself on its own automatically, even though it excludes binary uh, data, which I think the diligent, scrupulous uh, bibliographer or librarian can't, can't so easily ignore. Um, it's set in eight-point type um, and runs to 1,673 pages. Um, so it's a palpable reminder um, that if the computer, as a data processor, um, is in some ways already itself an archive. Um, its digital files, while palpably material, can't ever theoretically themselves be archived. Um, right, where in contrast, the, the traditional archive um, is a secure, ordered storage space, um, a closed system, is predicated on locatable objects. Um, the computer, in contrast, trades in dynamic processes in order to even understand uh, a readable file as such, right? So anyone who's, who's waited in um, you know, a special collections reading room um, for a rare book to be paged um, and brought to them knows that, that the archive separates, um, and in fact, I think, depends for its definition on the separation of storage and transfer. Um, that distinction, and we could map this distinction between storage and transfer even onto a floor plan or the architectural um, interior spaces of a library itself. That sort of distinction no longer makes sense uh, with the technical architecture of digital data, with its real-time calculations 
its recursive feedback loops, its emergent uh, structures of, of, of arranging data. So on the one hand, digital display, what, what I'm looking at here and what you're seeing a mirror of, um, requires a necessary um, interdependence and a theoretical blurring of concepts like memory and transfer, which in, in earlier digital um, devices was more easily separatable. Um, but object and algorithm are now much much less stable. The computer computers today figure memory as transfer, um, and they figure object as algorithm, um, and 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 vice versa. So that's one problem. On the other hand, um, but equally opposed, I think, to the defining traits of traditional archivalia, even as those terms no longer make sense without their others in the digital domain, even as, though, even as they become conceptually inextricable, uh, the logical and material structures of digital documents are now for the first time physically separatable. But they take different forms and they might, um, they might be in different locations, right? This is not true of the book brought to you in, in the special collections reading room, right? You don't need to wait for another document to be paged before you can render the book that's been brought to you legible, or even know if it is a book. But that is true for, for the file on the computer. You need, you need other files to tell you if it's a file at all, if it has data, what kind it is, and to let you, to let you see it. Or, um, maybe come at this just from a slightly different perspective, um, and I'm, I'm taking this from, from the scholar Wolfgang Ernst, um, who's argued that the computers operate at a microtemporality that flickers even faster than their own digital clocks um, can calculate. And they do this without the macrotemporality uh, on which traditional archives are based. So if even, even, if, even if my website um, you know, announces that it, um, I should note this quote, um, focuses on digital facsimiles of radical small press writing from the last quarter century. But as you know, the Y2K phenomenon reminded everyone, that's a time frame that is incomprehensible um, to the very machines meant to curate and maintain that archive itself. So in grammatical terms, this is the difference between you know, past perfect and a present progressive um, aspect of the verb. The archives preserve what has taken place, whereas digital documents, by right, impossible to fix, historically uh, are always taking place. The archivist produces more archive, and that is why the archive is never closed. And the archive, Derrida continues in that passage, um, thus opens out onto the future. And there's an inherent tension, I think, between um, that retrospective past tense of the archive, looking back at material that's at risk of disappearing, um, and so is needing to be uh, archived, to be preserved, um, and then it is dizzyingly eternal future continuous tense, that endless perpetuation of the archive attempting to record not only its archivality, but its current self as well. Is it, is it continuous? Is it continual future continuous tense to always will be archiving? Um, I may not have that right. Let me think about that. It's a continual future continuous tense. So, in its retrospect, and looking back, part of what the Eclipse Archive seeks to conserve, right, with its insistence on representing those print originals um, with facsimile images, is precisely what the digital archive necessarily loses, um, the facture um, and the material specificity of the book or the printed document as, as a palpable object. But my interest, and what drove the archive um, initially, my interest in that material specificity of those objects is, I, I want to be clear, not you know, wistfully nostalgic about um, the smell of paper or something like that. It's just coldly semiotic. I want to claim that every material aspect of a text, the layout, typeface, binding, font, ink, uh, et cetera, 
produces a, 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 a potentially full semantic charge. The format, physical support um, are not incidental to the meaning of a text. Um, and to take just a minor, seemingly incidental number as an example, uh, 0146 uh, um, These are the numbers printed on the copyright page of Lynn Higinian's uh, 1978 book, Gisualdo, uh, which appeared as number 15 from her own Toowoomba Press. Uh, and like all of the early Toowoomba books, uh, Gisualdo carries an international standard serial number, an ISSN, um, instead of an ISBN, an international standard book number, um, which is a fact that's likely to be lost in most transcriptions of this um, works content, right? If we thought of the digital, non-facsimile digital version of this book, they're not likely to have included um, the ISSN number. But it is one that this facsimile uh, captures. And it's a distinction that indicates the status of these early Toowoomba books um, as volumes in a serial publication, it classifies them with um, magazines rather than with um, books, even though they're all single author chapbooks. And look very much like any of the other books that were published as pamphlets um, by these same authors in the late 70s and 80s. But that categorization underscores the conceptual connection of these individual volumes to others in the series. Um, and it explains their sequential number. This is number 15. Um, it calls attention to the division of the early Toowoomba uh, catalog into two series of 25 numbers each. Um, and those series on their own, um, when looked at as a whole, uh, events significant structures that begin, begin and they end with books by Higinian herself. For instance, um, in both of those uh, 25 numbered sets, uh, a title by Carla Harriman immediately follows one by her husband, uh, Barrett Watton, so it establishes a, uh, a social, gendered, matrimonial uh, partnering suggests some sort of uh, publishing quid pro quo, um, and so on. But even without um, those patterns, the ISSN uh, number down in the bottom there suggests some of the broader social contexts in which Gisualdo might be read. So the economic and political history of postal rates, of arts funding um, in the US, um, as well as global standardizations, varying commercial and cultural claims on copyright status, right? The rights to reproduce these books, most of which um, the, both Barrett Watton and Carla Harriman um, are the two people who wouldn't let me reproduce books um, in this series just by chance. Um, they just happen to both say no. Um, but the rights to reproduce them fall to Higinian as the editor um, rather than to the individual authors. Um, we could we could have reproduced those um, against their wishes if, if, if we'd been less friendly. Um, and it suggests, I think, a community of readers who are connected by subscription. Um, so there's a rhythm and a spontaneity of periodical publication that might be read in contrast to the temporality of book publication, and so on and so on. And I think similarly, as cadexical objects, um, one of the striking aspects of these early Toowoomba press publications is the discrepancy between their printing, on the one hand, this carefully handset um, letterpress type, it's this hand printed with a, with a Chandler and Price platinum press um, on relatively heavy, I think if this were a better, a better image, you, you you see some of some of the um, some of the visual indications of the the relatively heavy, high quality grades of really elegantly textured um, stock. But then on the other hand, they're really um, uh, fairly sloppy um, sta staple binding. Um, this this saddle binding, which Virginia herself has referred to as uh, roughly staple. Um, this is from another uh, mysterious uh, ephemeron 
uh, from which there's no bibliographical record, no authorial memory, um, though I can tell from I can tell from the paper stock, I can tell um, from, from the type and the printing that's from Hedginian's Press um, around 1980. I think it's probably produced on the occasion of a reading that, um, that she and Bob Grenier uh, gave together at St. Mark's Poetry Project on April 8, 1981. Um, but the point here is this, this rough um, misaligned, um, it's only one, there's only one sheet, um, and they, they, didn't get it, they didn't get it straight, um, that rough staple binding. So um, these Toowoomba books originally uh, priced between one and three dollars, um, gesture both towards a fine press tradition of luxury, luxury bookmaking, and also this do-it-yourself um, spirit of hastily assembled, nominally priced publications from a 60s avant-garde spirit. Um, it was still something, this is something like, um, you know, it's probably something like, you know, somewhere between four, four and eight pounds um, today, adjusted for inflation. So with their, with their combination of this reverent attention to, uh, to the text that's typical of fine press printing, and the affront to that tradition through their staple binding, the Toowoomba publications uh, are simultaneously indexing this antiquarian um, tradition and a very contemporary vernacular tradition, specialized craft and anonymous commercial uh, practice, the codex and the pamphlet, um, to go back to that, that genre of, of, of the serial, that they, that they are Janus-faced like the archive itself, and that, that duplicity, or at least that, that discrepancy, um, has a great deal to say about the economic conditions of publication during this period. Um, it's a time when letterpress machines were being dumped um, and available to individuals um, by established bookmaking practices, because um, you know they're getting rid of these secondhand uh, proof presses um, and, and, and letterpress material um, because there are improvements and dramatic price drops to um, technologies like offset printing and, and most of all, photostat uh, printing. So that has changed already quite dramatically, I think, um, just, in the, just in the last couple of decades, just over the life of the Eclipse archive. So that the very same letterpress format um, of the chapbook today, I think, signifies something quite different than it did um, even in 19, 1981. That's a subject for another talk. All right, for now, um, maybe I'll just note the, the tension here between the antique and the modern um, that also enters into the semantic economy uh, of the poetry of Giswaldo itself. So after, after a brief introduction, um, the, first, the first proper section here um, opens Giswaldo gathered. Just Waldo extraordinary, and because he gathered thought as these things were bound, one doubts and hopes, and after four years, murdered. Just Waldo had time around, and even in these days appeared. Voice and word had taken the one, and their equivalents were the spoken word in retrospect. Giswaldo and I, they're a modernist, using purpose that went like Melchizedelich, without father and mother, of no progeny born, and died there. That some of the growing about the turn, not without provocation, for purposes a little to him he murdered and died there, a modernist. And so on. What I want to call attention to that vocabulary that's drawn from book binding, so gathered, bound, the terms, um, terme de métier um, from book production, makes the character of Giswaldo um, and the eponymous book title, Giswaldo, um, come to be conflated with, I think, a, a kind of careful indeterminacy right from the beginning. Um, and that lexicon of terme de métier, um, in their turn, draws attention to, I think, the bibliographic details of Giswaldo, the book, which unlike all of the other um, 49 uh, Toowoomba books is not stapled, 
um, not roughly stapled, but very neatly and tidily uh, hand, hand sewn, it's pamphlet stitched. So this is a, dis and you know, this again, this is something that, um, you know, a transcription of this text, um, you know, something like Project Bartleby or the Internet Archive, it, it just wants to give you the content of this book. He's gonna overlook um, the binding, and so overlook what is a discrepancy within the series of discrepancies that Gisualdo, as a book, um, is more aligned with the old-fashioned legacy of fine press printing than any of the other 49 roughly stapled titles published by Hygienian's Press. And the, the design of the text, uh, right, which includes this um, you know, liberal use of um, elegant um, decorative devices, uh, I, I think furthers that alignment. This, you know, think about whether this is lineated or not. It's apparently written in sections of prose, um, set in a fairly narrow um, block. This also right, trim um, and ratio and format, something that you can see in the archival image that you lose in um, just a reproduction of, of, of the poem or the content. Um, I think specifically uh, recalling something like the, the revised, the 1817, um, version of Coleridge's um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, but more generally, that ostentatious um, you know, extravagance of wastefully wide margins in certain examples of, of fine press printing, including the, the neo, um, the sort of neo-medieval um, tradition of arts and crafts, uh, printers like Emory Walker at, at, at Chiswick Press and so on. Um, and in corroborating those associations, just while they were set, um, set in Caslon, um, early 18th century typeface, which before became so ubiquitous as to be um, a, a default choice for modern job printers, had been revived by those very arts and crafts um, movement printers as, a, as an antique face um, with old fashioned connotations. So William Morris, um, saw Caslon as, as the proper antiquated balm to soothe uh, the offense caused by his, his bete noir, um, uh, the sweltering hideousness, this is a quote, the sweltering hideousness of uh, the Bodoni letter. Um, here, is that cat? I don't want to make you look at that sweltering hideousness. This is the balm <laughs> of, of Caslon. Um, but my point is that the design of Gisualdo um, is nicely recursive, that it evokes an earlier tradition of evoking earlier traditions. It, it, it has an antique look set in a face that was meant to evoke an antique look. And by not drawing attention to the discordant histories of printing and binding, like her other Tuoma books do, um, Gisualdo allows the text's own rhetorical tensions between old-fashioned subject, the medieval composer uh, Carlos Gisualdo, um, and postmodern agrammaticality, um, that, that paratactic disjunction that, that you heard in that opening section, allows that tension instead to come to the fore. So it shifts attention away from Virginian's heretical binding practice um, and toward the collage technique of her radical poetic composition. Um, she doesn't acknowledge this in the book, but almost the entirety of the language in, um, in, her, in her book, Giswaldo, comes from Glenn Watkins' 1973 Cambridge University press monograph, Giswaldo, um, The Man and His Music. So ultimately, the emphasis on the dissonance between form and content um, in the poem, between the presentation of the poem and its subject, is perfectly congruent with Higinian's ostensible theme, uh, which is this late Renaissance um, composer known for his daring violation, viol violations in, in several senses, but also his strikingly modernist chromatic dissonances that are built into his, his music. Right? He, he murdered and died there, uh, a modernist. And these are far from um, 
isolated instances. So the steeples that are absent from Giswolder with, with its tidy pamphlet stitch um, play a pointed role in Lorenzo Thomas's uh, book Dracula. It's published by uh, Angel Hair Books in 1973. Um, and in the context of um, you know, the, the famous eponymous Vampire, uh, I think that you know the twin puncture wounds of those um, those staples. What they're now resting in in the non-bond, low-grade, high acidity uh, commercial paper with a, a sort of evocative, um, evocative rust brown uh, stain um, align the form and the format and the content. Um, of this book in a way that encourages you know, readers to consider the textual status of the vampire himself, which is precisely what Thomas asks the reader to do, just more directly and discursively in the poem. Um, I'll read this to you. I don't know how legible that is. Um, this is um, the second section of the poem. This is, this is right, in the, right in the center of the page. Um, s start start the thing over again. Dracula is not a myth, but just another cheap novel written in the boring 18th, 19th century, made into the worst film of 1932, 1958, and unless we get wise to ourselves next year over again, then what is all this? So in that 19th century mode uh, of Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, right, the bite of the vampire's teeth and the bite of the primitive typewriter um, in, into the modern wood pulp uh, paper used by Mina Harker uh, is one of the keys to, to, the, to the story itself. Um, and Thomas's book is also filled with uh, instances of, of what we might read as puncture as printing. There's the blood drawing needles of a, uh, quote, remarkable tattoo is a, a tattoo that I think is both notable but also remarkable, um, re-inscribable. Um, there's the remarking, uh, quote, duplication design of a bus ticket uh, waiting the bite of the driver's ticket punch. Um, and there's an illustration, um, this is by Britton Wilkie, um, of, of this medieval scribe um, down here contemplating um, the, the stylized uh, bloody uh, punctures of the nails affixing um, Christ to the cross. So mimeographed um, from typewritten stencils in this method that echoes the punch of the ticket taper and the purple um, bruise of the tattoo, this mimeo ink that did its, itself had a, had a purple tinge to it, um, and which um, bleeds through the paper, to use the technical bibliographic idiom, I think you get the ghost of Thomas's mode of production haunting even the facsimile uh, of his book. That there's a revenant of the material in a way that, that the sterilizing reprint of the poem, as it would be reset in a clean reading copy, um, it has, in fact, it's been reprinted in Granary Books' Angel Hair Anthology, reset, cleanly uh, offset. Um, tries, tries to safely exorcise this. Here, lights are probably on too high to see this. So just, just a little, um, this, is, this is the verso, um, this is the scan of the verso page. You see just a little bit of the bleed, um, bleed through of that mimeograph method. So um, when the poem asks, what is all this? I think it, in part is the materiality of the mimeograph edition that answers, that it is a textual uh, vampire um, in which form and content feed off one another um, and need to be taken all together, that it is all um, this. What, what is all this? It is all this, including the ostensibly blank versos um, as well. When I, started the, when I started the archive, this was a time when um, you know, we tried to compress, we had, we had to compress files because people were accessing them over you know, dial-up modems. We, we couldn't store, we couldn't store the scan of a book on, on just a single zip drive. Um, and the librarian I consulted with initially just thought I was mad 
just waste all of the space scanning blank pages, but I was, I was really insisting that it was going to be important someday, um, and here it is. So by by reading the by reading these the details of bibli bibliography back into the narrative of Thomas's poem, um, I don't want to distract from you know other ways to read this. There's a lot of social uh, semantics um, in it, in its critique as well. Vampir vampirism in this book is figured um, as a, as a as, as the racialized influence on American culture. Um, you get both both the myth of the vampire and the rhetoric of um, race in America turning on, um, you know, turning on blood and so forth. Um, at the same time that you get, um, you know, the counterculture production of that original Mimeo uh, publication and the counterculture printing of the tattoo. You got to remember, this this was in 1973. Not everyone was tattooed all over um, like they are today. Um, these are both entering equally into narratives of standardization, uh, monotonous social regimentation, with their equally insistent demands um, for um, for homogeneity. This is this one. Let's see. So here's, here's here's one verse of page. Here's another. You can see how these are just barely ghosting ghosting through. Um, as Friedrich Kittler uh, remarks about Bram Stoker's work with an insight that I think applies equally to Thomas's poem. Quote, Dracula is no vampire novel, but rather the written account of our bureaucratization. And anyone is free to call this a horror novel as well. So that's standard, standardized, typewriter face, uh, typeface of Thomas's Dracula. And the rough-edged imperfections of the mimeograph, I think, accordingly, once again, uh, become profoundly ambivalent. So on the one hand, they evoke both the individual idiosyncratic directness of the type page. It's free from intervening um, procedures of commercial printing, um, compositing, um, and, and type setup. And they register both the unique wear of a particular Typewriter machines, letter forms, right? This, this is we look, you know, we could look under a loop. We could see that this, this is the signature look of the, the the single typewriter that was in the basement of St. Mark's Church on the Bowery, um, as well as the erratic force behind each keystroke. I think you know we, we could look here and and trace Ann Waldman's emphatic um, typing fingers, which letters she hits harder, which are which are closer to, to her weaker digits. Um, and speaking of fingers, on the, on the, on the other hand, um, the typewriter and the desktop duplicator themselves, of course, were also the epitome of everyday small business drudgery, the very emblem of modern bureaucratic um, paperwork. Um, more and more paperwork, we should remember, right, is the very origin of the archival impulse, <coughs> as well as the bureaucratic impulse as well. Um, so the typewriter, right, and the mimeo, both counterculture, do it yourself, and also um, just the, the worst sort of not doing it yourself. So in both of these cases, in Hygienian and in Thomas, the material conditions of uh, the texts could of course have been different, right? Dracula, Dracula might have been letter pressed on paper so thick that it didn't register any bleed through, just while it might have been stapled like any of the other books. My point is simply that, that they weren't. They are the case um, as we have them. And that any particular case is what permits and inflects meaning, as well as what permits uh, archive. And I also want to be clear that by focusing on these kind of minute particulars of bibliography, I'm not meaning to privilege um, or fetishize something like first editions or um, earlier editions or suggest that they have, I mean, there's, there's often this, this way that people talk about early editions as if they have better information, whatever, whatever that would mean. Um, and in fact, the, I think the main point I want to make today is that media obey um, something like a law of conservation, that their information is gained and lost 
in, in precisely equal and inverse rates. And this is a law that applies to digital media uh, as well. So where certain information is lost, obviously, in the translation from uh, print to s computer screen to projector screen, um, other information is just as quickly accruing. Um, we, we, can't lose, we can't lose materiality. So any work we encounter, at the moment of its encounter, um, is materially replete uh, and materially specific. And that's just as true of bound paper or, or bond paper um, as it is of networked uh, displays and digital projectors. I'm just going to end um, with an example of this conversion of materiality, um, go back to Clark Coolidge's uh, Smithsonian Depositions, and the other half of his book, Subject to a Film. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about it tomorrow. Um, we'll hopefully talk about it in, in the seminar part. Today, this is the cover of the, the, the book. Um, and Coolidge's work, um, Smithsonian Depositions, nod to Robert Smithson, um, and Smithson, like Smithson's own writing, collage of quotations um, that allegorizes um, I think it's, its theme of crystallization and mineral deposit as well as textual deposition um, in the very prose form of its interlocking paragraphs. Um, it's so hard to read. I'll, I'll read a little bit. A great many crystals of the same material start growing at about the same time in many different places. They grow until something gets in their way, or until they get in one another's way, and then they stop. Since they start with no knowledge of one another, they all have different orientations, and when they meet, they cannot join to form a single big crystal. The result is a polycrystalline mass. Its component crystals all have the same kind of orderliness, but they all have different directions to that orderliness. Polaroid contains crystals that behave like tourmaline. The process by which Polaroid is manufactured turns all the crystals the same way, so that the film is much like a broad, thin, single crystal plate of tourmaline. So the work here um, takes its theme, these particles of discrete, unrelated origins aligned into the uniform black rectangular Polaroid film, um, and, uh, as Michael Wilson has argued, um, extends that theme into its form. These sentences of discrete, unrelated origin aligned into a uniform black rectangle typographically interlocking prose. And you, you can see it's like a um, kind of like prose Tetris. Every paragraph's going to, every new paragraph's going to begin just after it, just at the point where the previous paragraph concludes. Um, and that allegorical doubling then doubles again when this crystalline prose about crystalline form and crystal subject matter gets illuminated to, say, the liquid, yeah, liquid crystal of um, a display screen um, when that work is read online as part of the digital archive of the eclipse. Um, so theme extended into form, and then form extended into format. Um, or if that aspect of the digital archive, uh, this archival version of this text uh, and its material specificity gets lost when it's projected onto non-crystal display or um, you know, old-fashioned projector screens or non-crystalline non -crystalline, um, beaded silicate, um, other resonances are going to come and take their, their place as well, kind of sympathetic vibration. So similarly, um, newly relevant because of this media recontextualization, um, another passage recontextualizes or makes a deposition of um, some sentences from Claude Lévi-Strauss's uh, Tris Tropique, uh, I'll just read you this paragraph. The photographic plate of night slowly revealed a seascape above the sea, an immense screen of clouds in front of an oceanic sky, tapering off into parallel peninsulas as a flat, sandy coast 
might be seen from swerving low flying plane, stretching its arrows into the sea. The light rays, which were now almost horizontal, illumined only the sides of the waves that were turned toward them and left the rest in shadow. The water, therefore, stood out in relief with clear, emphatic shadows, which seemed to have been hollowed out of metal. All transparency was gone. So on the one hand, it seems to be describing something like these lines of black and white that we see as prose, um, but also with the description of flatness, of screen, of projected light, seems to be thematizing how we're looking at this now. Um, give another uh, example. From one side of the dome around the edge curved to absent listeners, on the other, swelling brass and strings over fading pinks that have held the acoustics to auditorium. From the flat diameter of chairs, the hemisphere begins to lift to deepening black and star points come out of it, as if an upper magnesia peeled, leaving bare limes. Spaces between distances, between intensities, from origins of lit time could keep the eyes up all night, um, and so on. We could pursue these sort of textual, um, textually detailed uh, reading this more closely. It is a dense and strange um, text. I'm eager to see what people made of it. Um, it is obscure in some sense, regardless of its availability or the light that illuminates it. But my point is simply that the metaphoric conflation of film and writing um, made discursively uh, by the poems, Smithsonian Depositions, and this book, Smithsonian Depositions, and subject to a film, becomes materialized and literalized with photo offset reproduction, with photostatic reproduction, um, and then again, when its own writing exists on substrates that are themselves closer to film um, or to photography than they are to manuscript uh, print reproduction. It's as if Coolidge's text had been waiting just patiently for decades uh, for the technological moment when its format could be relevant to its content, right? which he never could have predicted. I see he's still using a typewriter, um, but he wrote the text that would be perfect for this very moment we're in. It, it's a kind of crazy future gambit uh, that replicates in miniature that essential nature of the avant-garde archive itself. And it's why the idea of an avant-garde archive is itself so paradoxical. So it looks back to the forward-looking moment of an avant-garde, but with a sort of impossibly belated uh, prolepsis, it also looks forward to a time when those avant-garde shock troops sent out ahead have still not yet ever arrived. Um, so like, like Smithsonian Depositions, itself this archive of deposited quotations from older books, reanimated by the future textual conditions uh, it could never precisely imagine. The archiving of Smithsonian Depositions and all the other avant-garde literature on Eclipse uh, looks back to an originary form. At the same time, it points to a future by anticipating right, some user um, some use, some moment for which this archive material is being saved. Um, the ar ar archives are always optimistic in this sense, which is, which is nice, but they're also impossible. And this is where that impossible temporality, um, that paradox of, of the avant-garde archive in its proleptic tardiness finally begins, I think, to make some sense. The avant-garde, uh, right, as a, as a vanguard or as, as some kind of pioneer, um, only becomes an avant-garde once others have followed. Um, right? Only after it is that they are themselves no longer avant-garde. So, right, if no one follows, they haven't come before anything. They're, they're not in advance. There's no avant to the avant-garde unless someone follows them. Um, they're simply they're eccentrics or they're outliers or, or they're fugitives or they're, they're lost. Um, you only know it's an avant-garde from the temporal perspective of the arrival of the arrière guard. Um, avant-garde become recognizable at the moment of their own disappearance. Um, they're legible only with their own erasure. And that contradictory logic, right, looking backward to look forward, uh, is, as, as we've seen, the paradoxical logic of an internet archive at its most fundamental technological 
the simultaneously offering and 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 withdrawing, um, displaying and obscuring, uh, fixing and flowing, preserving and and distributing. And furthermore, the availability of the digital archives holdings to its imagined audience, um, to that future generation for which things are being preserved, for which um, this generation that might finally need that archivalia, um, right? Uh, all of the internet's distributed freedoms, the streams of open access, of uh, digital democratic multiples, uh, all predicated on the strict constraints of absolutely unyielding, centralized, authoritarian protocols, as part of what Alexander Galloway's um, emphasized in his arguments about protocol. And I think we might further remember that the post-print digital publication, all of the cleanly defined uh, you know, digital bits of computer display uh, arise at the heart at the heart of the processor um, that's in here from blurry modulations of voltage. Um, right, the, there's an imprecise analog rheostasis of drops um, and surges across diodes that that machine is ultimately translating with all of all the errors of free point um, imprecision and, and um, algorithm anathema to the ideology of its own essence. Um, into this abstraction that we get of new media. So digital technology, the digital technology that's only originating in an analog um, interpretation. So this already now old new media um, is itself this sort of classic case of deconstruction. At the heart of the system, we find this diametric contradiction uh, of that system in the very core that makes it possible uh, in the first place. It depends on what uh, it would seem to need uh, by definition to exclude. It is this necessary impossibility, like a digital archive, or like an archive of the avant-garde, or uh, like the illuminating uh, revelations and disclosures of every surpassing uh, and occulting eclipse. Okay, I think that's enough for now. Let's take... Um, Take a really short break so that those who want to take off can take off, and we'll reconfigure tables and talk more and take questions and objections by whoever wants to stay. All right, thank you all.